In the time frame that we're in in the church, for the most part, the modern church has forsaken Sunday school. They've forsaken a lot of teaching. Amen. God's called me to be a teacher and a preacher. And so what the Lord's been putting on my heart is, is that you're going to mesh the two together. So many times, even on Sunday mornings, I'm not shrinking back. I could sit here and try to worry about making some kind of message and make it worry about how it's going to flow and make sure that I save my last point to the end so that I get you and all this kind of stuff like that. I'm, I'm not about that. I want to give you all the stuff up front. I don't, I'm not trying to hide anything, make it mysterious. I want to open up the word of God and let you see it clearly. Amen. As we grow together in Christ. So many times on Sunday mornings, and really every time I preach, I believe, it's going to start looking more and more like the mixture between a preaching message and a Sunday school ser uh, service. Amen? And so that's what this morning is. I'm telling you, we're going to learn some stuff this morning. And over these next few messages that I do preach, we're going to be learning some things about what's known as the historical books, okay? And within those books, we have the time frame of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now, there's other books that are considered Considered historical, but those are the three that I want to focus on. All right, real quickly, I wrote up here a timeline, and many of you have been familiar with the timeline how God has been about moving and operating in the midst of humanity. Amen. I want you to know that. You might have just showed up here for the first time. You're like, to be honest with you, I haven't really grown up in church. I don't know anything about the Bible. It's okay. You're going to get a crash course this morning. You're going to get a crash course this morning and you're going to have at least some context because I believe that everybody in here has the capability to learn and some people are really intelligent and they catch on real quick. Amen. And so what I want you to know though is this, is that if the story's real, and, you know, many of you, would, why would you use the conjunction if? Because I've talked to a lot of people that don't believe it's real. I've talked to a lot of people that don't believe the Bible's real. And so instead of me sitting over there trying to purposely offend them, oh, I speak with boldness. I speak with confidence. They know by the time I'm done what I believe. But I let them know if the story's real and God moved through humanity all of these years, all for the purpose to take his only begotten son, the sinless one, and hang him on a cross to die in your place and in my place, then it seems as though to me, if the story's real and we're an eternal soul and when we breathe our last breath here and take our first breath there, that we ought to be paying more attention to what the Word of God says, amen, and find out if what He's doing is really real, can we see it in the world that we live in, and does it mean anything to my life today? I want you to know that God has been moving throughout human history. Whether we understand it or know it or not does not change the facts. As a matter of fact, there's a spirit of deception in the earth. The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that there's a prince of the power of the air. He's been around since the Garden Incident. He's been around since the fall took place. His spirit, in an evil fashion, is attempting to close people's eyes to the truth of God, just as the Holy Spirit, in a righteous fashion, desires to open up people's eyes to to the truth of God. Amen. And so what I want you to know is, is that through science, through the intellect of man and through all of these various ways, the enemy of your soul is trying to convince you and your children and all the public system and government entities that God isn't real and he wants to move humanity away. God has been moving through humanity. See, there was a time after the fall that there was no nation called Israel. You can turn on CNN today, Fox News, whatever your flavor is. I don't really watch any of them anymore because I don't believe them. That's Amen. just me. Do what you want with that. Amen. Oh, you're not a Republican? I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not. I'm a conservative. What I believe is in smaller government, I believe in exalting God in the midst of a nation. I believe that, yes, man has a right to bear arms, and I believe that man has a right to freedom of speech, but I don't believe in politicians that say they're going to do one thing and turn around and do something different. They sign something different on a piece of paper, and they want us to be blind and act like they did what they said they were going to do, when in reality they're not. I'm telling you, there's something going on. I'm not going to tell you what it is all the time, but I'm going to lead you little hints, and you can try to start figuring some of that stuff out for yourself. Mm -hmm. But what I want you to know is this, is that God has been moving in the midst of humanity, and this is what he did. He called a man named Abraham out because he had a plan to create a nation. Mm -hmm. And through that nation, he gave a promise that he would give a Messiah. That's what Ballard sang on this morning. He talked about Messiah, Emmanuel, the anointed one. 
God called Abraham out. There was no nation called Israel. He said, come out from your father's house. I know that I repeat this a lot, but before you're done here, if you decide to go to another church, you're going to be ready because you're going to know more than the preacher if you hang out with me long enough. What's going to happen is this, is that God calls this man named Abraham out from amongst a heathen house, a heathen nation. There was no Israel. He said, come out from your father's house and I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Ultimately, 2,000 years later, Jesus was born, and 65 years later, the apostle Paul wrote a letter called to the Galatians. And in that letter, he said that the promise that was given to Abraham when it said seed, it was singular. One seed. Not many seeds as a whole nation, but one seed, and that seed was Christ. Meaning that way back 2000 B.C., when God pulled Abraham out and promised to make him a nation and that he would bless all of humanity through Abraham's seed, God in his mind and in his heart, the plan was already to give humanity Jesus. Does that make sense? Amen. So I want you to know that the God that you serve today is all knowing. This wasn't just some hiccup upon a stage that accidentally happened. This wasn't some impromptu plan, but instead God already knew the word of God says in 1 Peter 1.18, you were not redeemed. What does that mean? To be bought back. You were not purchased with, with silver or gold, which is corruptible, but, but instead you were purchased with the blood of the Lamb. Amen? And it was a blood that was foreordained before the foundations of the earth. Before God ever formed Adam of the clay and breathed life into his lungs, he already knew that Adam was going to fall. He already knew that he was going to send his son. Amen. And he already had a plan in place where he would bring the Messiah or the anointed one on the stage so that he could die for the sins of humanity. Amen. And so God called Abraham out and through Abraham, he promised to make a nation. Amen. That was about 2000 B.C. If you'll remember the story, a lot of things have happened. But what ends up taking place is that there's an exodus that happens. In other words, the children of Israel find themselves slaves in the land of Egypt. OK, the children of Israel find themselves slaves in the land of Egypt. Y'all stay focused on me. It's OK. You don't have to take Vivance. The Lord will help you to stay focused. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You don't need that stuff. I'm telling you right now, you don't. Jesus will give you focus. God had promised that he was going to make a nation. Amen. And what ends up happening in the midst of it all is that there's a famine in the land and they find themselves in, the, in a place called Egypt, which is representative of the world under the bondage of a man named Pharaoh, which is representative of the devil. And even the people of God today find themselves in bondages and enslaved in the system of the world. But God on Passover night told them to cut the throat of a lamb. I don't, I'm sorry if you're an animal activist. God used the sacrificial system in the killing of animals and the shedding of blood to paint a picture in red. He used red paint to represent the blood of Jesus. Because there's a barrier that stands between sinful man and a holy God. And God wanted to make it real clear what the problem was. And that there was only one solution and one plan. And God's not offended by it because he created it. Amen. He created the animal. He created the plan. And all of those, oh, Lord, help me. We got people out there that are worried about saving dolphins and saving whales. And we murder babies through abortion. How many times a day do we do it? And the whole time they ignore the blood of the eternal son. And they look at the fact that we're killing animals. What is wrong with humanity? She's lost. She's altogether undone. And she cannot even see the life or the love of God. She's been blinded. God had a plan to create a nation. And on that night, he allowed them to slit that animal's throat to collect his blood. And it served as a foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus was going to come and die on the cross. To save humanity from their sin. Amen. Amen. And then they entered into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. They go to a through a time frame of disobedience in the time frame of the judges. But right here in the book of Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there's a time frame of about 500 years. And there's multiple kings that are failing against God, living in disobedience towards God, worshiping false gods, engaging themselves in all manners of sexual sin 
leading the people to live such a way also. And what ends up happening is, is that God uses a string of prophets. Jeremiah being one that we're going to talk about today, but also involved in this is, is Isaiah and Ezekiel and other smaller prophets that would speak forth the truth of God, like Micaiah and, and Obadiah. And God would use these prophets to tell his children. See, God wants to send a preacher to you. God wants to send a preacher to you. He wants to send another Christian to you that has the love of God on the inside of them and is not scared to open their mouth and to yield their tongue to God to let you know that he's real and that he has a plan and a hope for your life. Amen. 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 And you would use the prophet Jeremiah to let them know in Isaiah also, if you don't turn from your ways, you're going to find yourself in bondage and captivity. As a matter of fact, your enemy is going to come from the north. And he's going to bring you under bondage and captivity. And after repeated warnings and repeated failures, the people of God refused to listen to the voice of God. And it's exactly what happened. At about 722 BC, I didn't put it up there, the northern kingdom of Assyria took the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. And at about 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Babylon, I'm sorry, the northern kingdom of Babylon took the southern portion of Israel into captivity. And so now I'm trying to bring you up to speed to a certain point where we are. Because after this, what I want you to know is that there's a certain succession of empires that takes place. Why do I need to know all of this? Because you need to understand the chronology of God. You need to understand how God's been moving through human history. You need to understand the mistakes that God's people have made in the past so that you and I don't repeat those mistakes again. Amen? Amen. We need to learn the Bible. What I'm trying to tell you is this. If the Word of God is, is really what it says it is and it communicates what it says it does, you and I cannot afford to lackadaisically approach the Word of God and not be a student of the Word and to allow God to reveal his communication to us. Amen. And so therefore it's my job as a preacher to make sure that we're trying to learn the word of God together. But what I want you to know is, is that while these, you know, if you go to school, when you learn school, uh, when you go to elementary school or whatever, they're not going to talk to you about Israel. Did they ever talk to you about Israel in school, in public school? No. If you send your kids to a Christian school, they will. They don't do a good enough job of it. You will not learn about the nation of Israel in the midst of a public school. All you're going to learn about is in those civilizations is things like Babylon and Persia and all of these things that have taken place. But what I want you to know is, is that mankind wants to chronicle history based upon wars and, and natural disasters and financial collapse. But God chronicles history based on salvation. Amen? Amen. And in the midst of all of this movement of all of these nations, we have this hidden truth that takes place that God's people are in the midst of all of this action that's taking place. And the only way that we can find it is within the, the, the covers of this book. And so what I want you to know is this, is that Babylon takes that southern portion into captivity. But then there's a change that takes place. And we're going to read about that. A change takes place where the Medo-Persian or the Persian Empire, which is modern-day Iran. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. So the, the Medo-Persian Empire or Iran takes over and defeats Babylon. And so now the children of Israel are under bondage to Persia. Later on, Alexander the Great will take over. And then from there comes the, the Empire of Rome, which was in existence and control whenever Jesus came upon the scene. But the emphasis of what we're going to be talking about this morning is a time frame in Israel's history whenever Persia was in control, whenever they were the leading and dominating empire and Israel was under their bondage. And in the midst of that time frame, we have these three books that I want to focus on maybe over the next few times that I preach. We have the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And within that also this morning we're going to talk about prophecies that were spoken of by Daniel and some things that happened in the prophet Zechariah and also some things that Jeremiah spoke. Amen? Amen. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to try to find the book of Ezra if you have your Bible. If you have a, if you have a phone app, then like one of my friends tells me you're cheating. Ha <laughs> ha, but that's okay. I still cheat. 
But what I want you to know is, is I want you to find the book of Ezra. And the reason that I'm saying it that way is because it's an interesting thing. These three books are not in chronological order. And I just wanted to point that out to you. Because if you ever take or embark upon the adventure of reading the entire Bible, that's one thing that you may notice as you're reading is that these three books seem to be out of place. But this is where the Jewish people place them. And so the book of Ezra comes right after 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Kings, you see, take place over here. These three books take place about 100 years later. And, but yet at the same time, they take place at the same time that these books in the back happen. Not these big prophets like Ezekiel and Isaiah, but like Daniel and, and, uh, and Zechariah towards the back of the book. And so what's happening now in this time frame is this, is that, see, there was also a temple here. I'm giving you a lot of information, but maybe this was stuff that nobody ever took the time to teach you. That you realize that in this time frame here at the Exodus, that the children of Israel didn't have a temple. There was something called a tabernacle, a tent. And they worshiped God in this tent. But whenever David, after King David, during the time frame of the kings, God allowed Solomon to build a temple. Amen. But what ends up happening is, is that because of their disobedience, what ends up taking place is, is that the Solomon temple is destroyed. And so during this time frame here that we're going to be talking about, Jerusalem is laid waste. Because of their disobedience, because of their refusal to hear God's word, Jerusalem, the city of peace, that's what it means. Jerusalem, Salam, Shalom, peace. The city of peace. Why peace? Because the presence of God lives there. How does the presence of God live there? Because there's a structure known as a temple. And within that structure known as a temple, there's a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark of the Covenant, there is the Word of God, the Ten Commandments. And upon there, there's a mercy seat upon which the blood is applied. The sacrifice that allows Israel to be seen as innocent. And also in front of the entranceway into the temple, there's a brazen altar. Brazen, bronze, representative of judgment. And upon that altar, there is fire. And upon that fire, an animal is placed as a sacrifice. And that animal placed as a sacrifice is a foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus Christ that removes the problem of sin that stands between man and God. And so within this city and the walls contained in here is a city that's supposed to be known as peace. And I've preached this way before, but I want to remind you that within this vessel, Known as your humanity, that God has placed you. There's supposed to be a city in there known as peace. God wants peace on the inside of your heart, amen? He wants peace on the inside of your life, amen? And the only way that you'll ever find peace on the inside of your heart and on the inside of your life is if you have the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the presence of the eternal God living and dwelling on the inside of you. And the only way that'll happen is if you allow the blood to be placed Upon your heart that you receive the sacrifice of the eternal son, the eternal lamb. Amen? Amen. And so that's where we are in the midst of this story. And I'm going to read some scripture. We're going to read the whole first chapter. Did I tell you to go to Nehemiah or did I tell you to go to Ezra? Ezra. Good. I told you the right thing. We're going to read the whole first chapter of Ezra. And then we're going to read a small portion of Nehemiah. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. We're going to trust God that this is going to come out the way he wants it. Amen? All right. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, I've already broke that down for you, where Persia is and what's going on with that, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. In other words, Jeremiah has already spoken something. And now time has passed, and it's time now for God to fulfill the word that he put in Jeremiah's mouth. And how does he choose to do that? Through an enemy king. God moved... Listen, I don't care what the world's doing. I don't care what the government's doing. I don't care what it looks like out there. If you've done any digging behind the scenes, then you know that things aren't the way that they appear to the naked eye. But what I'm here to tell you is this, is that God is ultimately sovereign, 
and he is ultimately in control. And just as he used Pharaoh in order to discipline his children and to bring them to a place, he uses kings like Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, and he will use the governments of today in order to move forward his plan. But there's coming a day, hear me close, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. And so God moves upon this man. It says right here that he might fulfill the words of Jeremiah. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people. His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. Remember how I told you the temple was destroyed. Build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts. Beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them, whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with precious things. Beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem. See, we're going to talk about that in a second. Whenever Babylon took over Israel, they took all of the goods that were in the temple and they brought them with them. All right. And so now Cyrus gives it a decree all these years later. It's time to go back and build the house of God. And I want you to take these articles with you because in order to worship God, you have to have them with you. It goes on to say, even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, 30 chargers of gold, 1,000 chargers of silver, 9 and 20 knives, 30 basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, 410 and other vessels, 1,000. And all the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,000 and 400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. So what are all these things for? Knives and everything. They got to you understand the process. They have to skin the animals. They have to cut the animals open. They have to look on the inside of the animal to make sure that there's no blemish because they could not have a blemish on the inside of the animal because it was representative of the sinless life of Jesus. And if there was a blemish in the animal, even a thousand years before Jesus showed up, that animal had had to be thrown out. Another one had to be skinned and had to be cut open. It's in, I'm sorry, it just is what it is. Its intestines had to be gone through. It had to make sure that there was no cancer, there was no blemish, that there wasn't growing something growing on the left kidney because if it did, they needed to take that carcass and throw it out and skin another one and cut it open. Oh, it's so gruesome. So much blood littered upon the ground. Yes, because the, the sin is gruesome and it holds mankind back from a holy God. But God has a beautiful plan. Amen. Amen. He has a beautiful plan and he wants to restore you and I into his presence. And he sees the situation that we're in and he has mercy and grace. He wants to love us through the giving of his son. All right. Nehemiah chapter one. Really, I'm going to just read. Uh, I really wanted to just read a uh, uh, last portion of Nehemiah chapter one, verse 11. But we'll go ahead and read all of verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee. So this is Nehemiah 1 verse 11. Let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of the servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Now I'm not done yet, but I want to make a point. Once again, Ezra and Nehemiah are taking place about the same time. What God is on God's heart now is for his house to be rebuilt. Why? So that his presence can be back in Jerusalem. So the city can be rebuilt. So that he can bring peace to his people. God strategically places people in certain spots and in circumstances. And God has strategically placed Nehemiah in this place right here. 
Nehemiah says that the Lord began to show him something. And we're going to go back. We're going to flash back a little bit like Hollywood this morning. We're going to go back to it. We're going to get there. But what ends up happening is, is that Nehemiah has showed him something. And now Nehemiah tells us, I was the king's cupbearer. What does that mean? He had access to the presence of the king like nobody else. What is a cupbearer? A cupbearer is the person that when it was time for the king to drink some wine, the cupbearer was in charge of making sure that the wine wasn't poisoned. He was the most trustworthy person in the king's court, and he was a Jew. And, and Nehemiah would be the one that would every day spend time in the presence of the king. Another cup, sir? It's all been tested and it's ready for you. And the king had come to know Nehemiah in such a way that he understood his countenance. He understood intricate details about his personality. He knew that for the most part, Nehemiah, even though he was in the land of captivity, was a person that was full of joy. And all it took was the slightest little change in the way that he might have said a word, in the word choice that he used, in the way that his face looked when he entered into the presence. The king knew something was different. Let's go to verse 1 of chapter 2. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine, and I gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sat in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is the countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And I said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, another word for tombs, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Nehemiah has a heart that's broken because of the condition of his people. Nehemiah has been given word, and we'll go back to it and read it, that, that things are not going well in Jerusalem. That things are because of the sins of the fathers of the past, that things still lay desolate. And I'm here to tell you that I say it a lot, but the modern church is in trouble. The modern church is in trouble because they're following after the ways of people that do not want to stay true to the word of God. They're recreating and they're repackaging the gospel in such a way to make it palatable to the people. But what the people need, they think that they're making it relevant to the people. Like it's going to apply to your life. The Lord spoke to my heart and I know I've already told you this. My word is relevant because it's my word. My word is relevant because I am God and you're my clay and I formed you and fashioned you with my hand and you better learn what I have to say and you better not believe what some man that's greedy for his own belly and wants to just fill his church up and won't tell the word of God for the way that it's written. Amen. Lord said, the Lord showed me you're not perfect, son. You got filthy garments. You're not right, but because of me and my sacrifice and your willingness to put your faith in that, now I have clothed you with the righteousness of my son. And if I remove my hand off of your life, you'll fall flat on your face. But what I've called you to do is to speak the truth of my word. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're going through, you've been called to speak the word of the living God. Speak it, son. I'm here to tell you. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Clap. I'm here to tell you we need a preacher that will tell the truth. Amen. Lord, help the preacher tell the truth. Amen? Amen? And so here we are in the midst of this situation. Now I want you to know Nehemiah sees, you got to turn all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. Nehemiah sees the condition of the people. And throughout these books, what we see is a remembrance. As we move forward and they pull out the old scrolls and they begin to read again. There's going to be a remembrance. You're going to even see references in it before this message is over. That God already had forewarned his people. See, what I want you to understand, and I know I've said this many times, but we have new people here today. God has showed me that the ancient Israel is like the older brother to Christian. Ancient Israel is the offspring of God, and he has already journeyed a journey. And along his journey, he's taken wrong turns and he's gone down bad pathways and he's fallen and many times he's gotten back up and he's gone in certain directions that cause trouble between him and God. 
And what the God would say, what God would say to me and tell me to tell you is, as his little brother Christian, we're supposed to pay attention to his journey. We're supposed to watch what he did. Amen. Amen. We're supposed to ask the Lord to intervene. Amen. Teach us your ways, O oh God, that we might not transgress you. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, God had told him in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at verse 1 through 3. And it shall come to pass if you shall hearken. What does that mean? To listen and obey. If you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord your God will set you on high above the nations of the earth. Amen. Have you ever been in the presence of a Christian that they're so spiritually superior? Oh, God's done a wonderful work in my life, and don't you wish that you were where I am today? God doesn't want to exalt his people so that he can look down their spiritual nose at someone else in the midst of their plight. No, God wants to elevate his people so that the dying world around him will know that there's a real God that has a real people. Amen. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Help the preacher remember that. Oh, Jesus, help the preacher remember when he was in the midst of the pit and he couldn't get out. He was shackled, even as a Christian, bound with lust, bound with, with horrible thoughts, bound with, with chemicals, going to church, paying money, putting it in the bucket, trying to raise my hand in the midst of service, bound. Lord, don't let the preacher forget what you delivered him out of. Hallelujah. How with one word you call something to change in the spiritual realm. And all of a sudden, chains started being broken in the physical realm. There's hope for you today, Christian. And there's people like Ballard sung about. Sing that again tonight. There's people like Ballard sung about. Millions of souls. They don't know you're Jesus. Come on, Christian. We got to let the Lord change us and set us free so that we would be liberated as a clay vessel. Like Emmanuel's song said, God with us, God in us. He wants to reveal himself to a lost and a dying world through this clay vessel that he formed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants to exalt his people so that the world around him is going to say it. He says, blessed shall you be in the city, verse 3, and blessed shall you be in the field. Look at verse 8. The Lord shall command a blessing upon you in your storehouses and all you set your hand on. And he shall bless you in the land which the Lord your God giveth thee. Some people stand around and they're like, man, I've been serving God, putting my money in the bucket. I haven't seen God bless me. Well, number one, you might have to learn some things like I had to learn. Mm -hmm. You can't sit around and wait for something just to show up in the mailbox, Christian. You got to get out there and get your hands dirty. You got to go to work if you want to be blessed financially. I mean, you may not even care about that. And that's cool with me, too. Because if you're not careful, it'll become your God. It almost did that to me. We got to find the right balance. Amen. I will bless all that you set your hand to. So, number one, you got to put your hand on it. Number two, you got to be careful that you don't let it slip out your hand. Because just because you make some decent money doesn't mean you can try to live like a multimillionaire whenever you're not one. Amen. Amen? Keep on charging the car. We already preached on that. The debt slave. Owe your life to the Rockefeller family. Chase Manhattan Bank. Come on, somebody. Help us. Help us to get our mind right. That we don't become debt slaves. Okay, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Verse 8. Verse 9. The Lord shall establish you as a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee. If you shall keep the commandments of the Lord, he wants to establish you as a holy people. He's looking for a separated people so that the world would know. And look at verse 10. And all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Now that word right there, afraid, really means respect and reverence. Whenever the world around you sees God's hand in your life and how he's elevated you because you were willing to learn his word and to hearken to it. Oh, it pleases him so much. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Think about a man. I know it's hard for us to con conceive of God sometimes. Think about a man that spent his whole life working on a book that he felt like if anybody would read this book, 
they would be just oh so blessed. But nobody really cared about the book. Instead, they took it and they left it on a shelf and they let it get dusty. And nobody really paid attention to it. But then every now and then he'd hear a story. Somebody would shoot him an email. Somebody would tell him, man, I read your book. I read your book and it blessed me. It had some things in it that really touched my life. I'm here to tell you that God has spent the entire time frame of humanity writing a book. And now that the book's been written for the rest of the time after it was written, he's wanting mankind to read it. But instead of reading it, they scoff at it and they leave it up on a shelf where it collects dust. But every now and then you'll find a person that's willing to read it. Not only read it, but hearken diligently to listen to what the word of God says. None of us in this room are perfect. But listen, you either have a spirit that wants to learn of God and walk with God. Or you have a spirit of disobedience and rebellion. And just like the children of Israel in the wilderness, you become stiff-necked, hard-hearted, stubborn, and refuse to listen to the word of God. I hope that's not you. I don't want it to be me. Amen. Lord, help us. All right, so it says right here in verse 15, but if it shall come to pass, don't you hate that word, but? <laughs> if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Verse 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. That's what's happened in the time frame that we're talking about this morning. Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther. That, that before your enemies you shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and you shall be removed. Removed from where? From the land that I gave you. From the city called peace and into all the kingdoms of the earth. And so here we stand in our time frame of Nehemiah and Ezra where the children of God after repeated disobedience have been taken away by God and now they find themselves captive in a foreign land. But there's always good news. God always has a prophet. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 25. There's always a prophet in the land. A man that God will call and touch a coal to his lips and purge his lips and tell him to speak. And he'll open his mouth even though he doesn't feel like it sometimes. Because God will have a hold of him. God will put a hook in his mouth and tell him to speak. And Jeremiah was one of those men. And he said in verse 12 of chapter 25, It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, which is another name for the Babylonians, and will make it perpetual desolation. So God said if you don't get your act together, the northern kingdom, which is Babylon, is going to take you into captivity. And that happened at the, towards the end of Jeremiah's ministry. But yet God spoke through Jeremiah and said, 70 years, 70 years, and then I'm going to punish the king of Babylon. And I'm, going to free, I'm not going to free my people at that time, but I'm going to punish the king of Babylon. And some things start shifting in the spiritual climate that causes changes to take place in the physical realm. Amen. Let's turn to Daniel real quick. Daniel chapter uh, 5. So during this time frame of Daniel chapter 5, there's a king called Belshazzar, who's actually the, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon whenever Israel was invaded. And you remember the story I preached a while back? I preached a couple of messages. Well, I preached that one message called when the, when the furnace gets hot. And we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we talked about how Daniel and those three Hebrew boys were deported from, from Israel to Babylon. And that they were the highest quality of people in the land. They were the nobility. At that point in time, Babylon left some people in the land. Those that were maybe of lesser economic status or didn't have as much intelligence. The more higher level people that could really be utilized in the kingdom were brought. Remember that? We talked about how this doesn't have anything to do with the story, but it's a good point. We talked about how the, early on that the world, Babylon, wanted them to eat the delicacies or their nutrition, their food. And how I told you that the world wants you to eat what it's offering. I want you to listen to its music. I want you to watch its movies. I want you to buy into its plan. But the fact that the matter, oh, you're a law preacher. No, you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is they're trying to feed you a diet. They're purposefully trying to feed you a diet to move you away and to renew your mind. No, to keep your mind the same like you were born like Adam. They want to infiltrate your mind 
and make you stay the same and keep you out of this that will bring restoration and renewal to your mind. And so they want to basically brainwash you into staying the way that you were born like Adam. Nevertheless, the Hebrew boys refused to do that. Mm -hmm. And later on, they came to a big old trial in their life. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Daniel found himself in the midst of a lion's den. I want to tell you something that the word of God says that your adversary, the devil, he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But just as God knew how to keep that lion, those lions mouth shut, he knows how to keep that other lion's mouth shut. And even though the enemy of your soul thinks that he's going to overcome you with the power of sin, I got good news for you. The plan of God through Jesus Christ and what he did, if you'll keep your faith in that, the grace of the Holy Spirit will shut that lion's mouth and keep him from destroying you and from tearing you apart. Amen. If you're willing to allow him to have his way in your life. And just like them three Hebrew boys, I can't leave them out. God will allow the trials of a fiery furnace to take place in your life. Why does he do that? I don't like it when he does it. Well, I don't like it either. But guess what? It's time to quit crying. It's time to come to the realization of this. God is sovereign and he's in control. He knows where to place you in order to purge you. The word of God, Job said this. He said, when I come forth, I will be like gold. Amen. And those boys were not hurt because Jesus was with them in the midst of the fire the whole time. Praise God. All right. So that's another story. But listen, now this is that getting Daniel's getting older now. And Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he had a dream. This is an interesting thing. So they're sitting here having a party. Nebuchadnezzar's dead. Belshazzar is having a party. And they got all these women, you know, dancing, doing their thing, probably belly dancing because that's what they do over there. And they're over there having this party. And all of a sudden he gets this bright idea. He says, go and get those artifacts from the temple uh, that we took, that my daddy took from Israel. Remember all those gold cups and all that stuff? Go get some of those and let's drink wine out of those. Because, see, we got all this power. We got all this prestige. And their little old God couldn't even do nothing for them. And so they're over here having a party and they're drinking out of these gold cups that belong to the God of Israel. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, tell me this wouldn't freak you out, a hand shows up. A hand shows up and he goes to the wall and it starts writing stuff up on the wall. Starts writing a message. And nobody really understands. Well, all of a sudden, they have to call Daniel in there. And here's where we start in Daniel chapter 5 verse 18 and it's worth reading. Daniel says, Oh, thou king. The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would slew and whom he, would, he kept alive and whom he would he set up and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, don't let pride get in your heart, Christian, and his mind hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like an oxen. Can you imagine a man on his hands and knees eating, grazing like an oxen? His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. Though you knew all this, oh Lord help us, you even knew it, and you still wouldn't humble your heart. But instead you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written, many, many tekel abharshin. This is the interpretation of the thing, many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Wow. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold. You can't change it now, king. It's too late. You can put a cloth on him and a chain on his neck, but the judgment has been given. Yeah. 
It says right here, put a gold chain on his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old, meaning 62 years old. I want you to see something. Many times in your life as a child of God, you may find yourself in the midst of circumstances that there appears to be no way out. There appears to be no hope. The children of Israel find themselves under Babylonian bondage and they're just sitting there captive and they don't know how they're going to get out of their circumstance. Amen. The city is broken. The, the temple is destroyed. The Ark of the Covenant isn't where it's supposed to be. The altar of sacrifice isn't burning sacrifices. The presence of God isn't in the midst of the city. The city that's supposed to be known as peace is empty of the presence of God. There's no peace in the midst of their lives. And even many Christians find themselves in a similar circumstance that everything is chaos. Everything is turmoil. And they feel as though there's no peace in the midst of their circumstance. I got I got to tell you, Christian, that you got to hold on. I got to tell you that you're going to have to have the heart of Nehemiah like we're about to see in a minute. And you're going to have to come clean with the Lord. And you're going to have to take responsibility for your own actions. And you're going to have to come to the realization that it's not everybody else's fault. And that who God's trying to get a hold of is you. Amen. And whenever you're willing to come clean with him, he's going to cause something to shift in the spiritual realm. You're going to cause a hand to show up in the midst of the world's party, in the midst of the devil's party that he's having in your life, and a little sign is going to be written on the wall, and it's going to say, no, there's a shift in the spiritual realm that's taking place, and now you're going to see some stuff start moving in the physical realm. All right, now we're actually where we need to be in the book of Ezra. Amen. That was my introduction. I promise my message will be a lot shorter than my introduction. Praise God. So where we are in this first chapter of Ezra, if you'll remember, that the King Cyrus had given a decree. And you remember what the decree was? Rebuild the temple. I want to rebuild the house of God. The Cyrus's heart was stirred upon to rebuild the house of God so that the people of God could continue to worship the Lord. And so from there, I want you to see something in Ezra chapter 3. It says in Ezra chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. It really would have been better interpreted that they set the altar upon his bases and did what they were supposed to do in spite of the fact that they were fearful of the people around them. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to share two things with you. First of all, the altar was being reestablished in the life of God's people. The temple wasn't rebuilt yet. You understand that? The temple still lays destroyed. The city still lays destroyed. But yet what they, the first thing they do is they rebuild the altar and they start offering sacrifice again. When you find yourself in the midst of a situation where you're captive and you have no, and it seems as though there's no hope, you need to come back to the first place where you first started. You need to bow your knee back at the cross, amen. You need to put your hope and your trust in the plan of God and you need to allow the cross to have its way in your life which brings righteousness and allows the grace of God to flow in your life. That's number one. Number two, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles. I taught you about the Feast a while back. The Feast of Tabernacles Tabernacles was once a year in the month of Nisan, in the seventh month, amen, there was three fe feast festivals, and in this festival of the tabernacles, they would have to take branches and build themselves a temporary structure and live in it for a week. What did it remind them of? It reminded them of the fact that God delivered them out of Egypt. 
It reminded them of the fact that God delivered them out of Egypt and even though they wandered in a wilderness, He brought them to a promised land. What's the point to that? Not only do you need to remember that it's the cross of Jesus Christ that makes you righteous and gives you access to the grace of God, but you need to remember past victories in your life. Has God ever delivered you from something in your life? Has God ever showed up in the midst of your life? Did He ever pull you out of, a, out of the world? Did he ever do something on the inside of you and put his hope and his love on the inside of you? Can, can you remember back to what he did for you? Amen. Can you be like young David and walk with such confidence and boldness that whenever he showed up to, to put that stone and sink in Goliath's head, he already had some victories behind him. He had already killed a lion. He had already killed a bear. And now this uncircumcised Philistine was going to fall also. I don't know about you, but God's given me some victories in my life. And it gives me hope to remember that if I keep my eyes focused on him, sometimes I get diverted. Lord, help me keep my eyes focused on you. That there's more victories on the way. I want to encourage you with that this morning. Because sometimes you're going to find yourself feeling overwhelmed. Don't forget. Don't forget to put your faith back in the finished work of Christ. And don't forget that God has delivered you in the past. And that there's more victories in the future. Amen. Amen. Praise you Lord. And so, listen, they started burning these, these offerings, and I've got a picture of this. I don't know about you, but I try to see the Bible in real time. And I see all this smoke rising up in the sky. You know, there's something different. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there hadn't been any smoke up until that day they burnt that first animal. The sky was smokeless. What you've got to understand is, is that there's all kind of enemies of Israel that have been in the land. I don't really have time to develop this thought, but I tried to teach it to you a while back. The Samaritans. You remember that? The Samaritan woman in the New Testament. The Good Samaritan. See, these people were half-breeds. The Israelites hated them. They hated the Israelites. But it all goes back to the fall of Solomon and the Assyrian captivity. And what happened was, was that they allowed people to live in this place of Israel and they interbred with people of other religions and they weren't really following the true God. Oh, they said that they were. They had a portion of him. Oh, this is going to get good. They had a portion of him in the midst of their theology, but it wasn't the real God. They weren't really serving him. And all of a sudden, the sky has been smokeless for at least 70 years, if not more. And now all of a sudden, smoke's up in the air. It's like, what's going on here? They even reestablished the altar. They got smoke up in the air. Look what it says in chapter 4, verse 1 of Ezra. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built, were building the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and to the chief of the fathers and said unto him, he was also in the lineage of Jesus, by the way, and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Isherhaddon of Asher, which brought us up here, you liar. You do not offer sacrifice to the same God. You got a little bit of his theology in the midst of your theology, but you are not truly serving the God. Look what they tell him. Verse 3. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us. To build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Verse 4, then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. Came first and wanted to infiltrate. Robert and I read an art, uh, a prophecy a long time ago that was written in the 70s, and it said in the end days... They're going to have just enough truth in the midst of their message to draw people in. And then whenever they got people in, they're going to start showing their real colors. And it's going to be a counterfeit theology. And I'm telling you, this is the time. We're in the midst of it now. These people right here are saying we serve the same God. We have the same sacrifice. I'm telling you that there's people that are preaching today. And the, natural, the normal ear of the Christian can't hear the difference. I've talked to pastors before. I'm just telling you. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you the truth. I've talked to pastors before. And I tried to explain to them about the message of the cross or the sacrifice. He said, I got a problem with a certain ministry. They keep saying that these people don't preach the cross. But all I hear coming out of other people's mouths is they say the word cross. And I said, dude, don't you understand? 
that people can say the word cross 15 times and not preach the cross. And what I mean by that is this, is that it's not just about you making it to heaven at the cross. It's about the fact that Jesus broke the back of sin at the cross. It's about through the cross, Jesus provided righteousness for you. It's about through the cross, you can't earn anything with God. It's about because of the cross, you don't have a church that's just filled with programs to keep people busy and build a social network. It's because of the truth of the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified that you learn the gospel and you let it reach on the inside of you. And you let the truth be in you so that you can allow it to come out of you. Amen. Amen. So there we go in verse 4. But look at this. It says in um, verse 17. And then sent the king an answer unto Rehum, the chancellor, and to Shemshai, the scribe. This is Ezra chapter 4, verse 17. And to the rest of their companions that dwell in Samaria. And unto the rest of the, the rest beyond the river. Peace. And at such a time. They brought a letter. These same people that tried to come and say, hey, we serve the same God. Can we hang out with you? Whenever they were told no, what they did, they wrote a letter to the king to try to influence him. See, the edict has already gone forth. What happened? Cyrus said, go rebuild the house. Now we got a new king. And now these guys want to come in and they want to cause trouble. Just bear with me. This morning's a long message, but we're getting close to the end. All right. He says, and, and it says, the letter which you sent. Now, this is the king talking. The letter which you sent unto us has been plainly read before me. And I commanded and search has been made, and it is found that this city of old time, talking about Jerusalem, has made insurrection against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. What you said was true in the letter. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem. Who, who's he talking about? David. And which have ruled over all countries beyond the river, and toll, tribute, and custom was paid unto them. Now this king's getting scared. These people might rise up again and get powerful. Give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease and that this city not be built until another commandment shall be given from me. Take heed now that you fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and they made them to cease by force and power. One of the main things that I wanted to share with you on that right there as you turn to chapter 6 is this. Is that if you think the devil's going to give up, you're wrong. Just as soon as you feel like you got a break in your life, I'm telling you right now, as soon as you think you got a break in your life, the enemy's going to show up and he's going to turn up the heat. I'm just telling you, get comfortable in the midst of that chaos. Because listen, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. When you connect yourself to the real Jesus and the real gospel, I'm telling you, there's going to be, there's going to be an adversary that's going to come against you and try to frustrate you. But listen, hold on to Jesus because he'll give you peace even in the midst of that. You know how you know when you're in God's will? I was sitting in the church one time and the preacher said, if you're getting beat up, then you know you're in God's will. And that's a lie. When he said it, I knew it was wrong. Let me tell you why. Because I was looking at pornography. Can I, is it okay if I get real with you? As a Christian, somebody paying tithes, I was looking at pornography. I was bound by lust. I was sitting in the back of that church and he said, if you got some bad stuff going on in your life, then you must be doing something for God. I'm like, he can't be telling the truth because I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing. The difference between, there may be some stuff going on in your life, but you know how when you're in the will of God, even though there's stuff going on in your life, chaos, you got peace in the midst of your life. And I can assure you that Max sitting in the back of that church that morning didn't have no peace in his life. There was all kind of chaos going on, all kind of confusion, all kind of misery taking place, but there was no peace. But I got good news. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. If the Lord's in the midst of it and you're doing what he's asked you to do, you can have peace in the midst of your life. Have you ever felt the lack of peace and then all of a sudden it shows up? That's a good thing. It's okay if I share with you the truth, right? It's okay if I use myself as an example of somebody that was struggling in faith. It's okay, Mom. The Lord set me free. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. We've not got enough of that. All right. Chapter 6. Then Darius, the king, made a decree. See, even though the, the enemy has a plan to stop the plan of God, God's, even though the enemy won't quit, God ain't going to quit either. And he's going to keep on moving on people's hearts, and he will get his plan done. I'm telling you, he's going to get it done. It says, Then Darius, the king, made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls. In other words, go to the house where they keep all the scrolls, 
and go get me this one particular one. How did they figure out? I mean, you, this is a library. Anyway, they brought in that scroll where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. There was found at Agmetha in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, the place where the, they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits, and breadth three score cubits. The point that I wanted to make was this. The enemy can try to come against, even though Cyrus made the decree, and another king comes along, and the enemy comes in and tries to cause confusion. God comes back around again, and he finds one that he can get a hold of his heart, and he allows the decree to be reestablished. Amen? All right, so now I want you to go to Nehemiah, and I got three points that I want to make real quick. And I'm going to make it fast. I promise. In Nehemiah, thank you, Annette, for giving me that permission. She said, take your time. In Nehemiah, we've already read the story. But let's go back to chapter 1, verse 1. This is how it all started for Nehemiah. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, that means he was also a Jewish man, he came and he and certain men of Judah. So they came up. He's over here in Persia, but they're coming back from Jerusalem to give a report. It says, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped. People had been being going back to the area, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And this is what they said unto me. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Look at this. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I want you to know that Nehemiah, we've already traveled this course, is brought back to Deuteronomy 28. And he remembers how God had promised that if they would just listen to the voice of God, that God would bless them. But that if they did, that there would be a curse of captivity. And now he hears the story of what sin can do as far as destruction in the life of the believer. You know, many times whenever we hear the preacher talk about sin in the life and how it can bring destruction and how it can cause pain. It, it, it's like we hear it by the hearing of the ear, but it's difficult for us to really see it. I want you to see something in chapter 2, verse 13, and this is my first point. When we go from hearing about sin's destruction to seeing sin's destruction, it has an effect on us. It says in verse 13 of chapter 2, I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. I want you to know that Nehemiah at that point, he saw it, amen? He saw the destruction with his own eyes. And I can only imagine the, the, the pain and the difficulty that it caused him to realize what was, what was taking place and how the people of God had transgressed God. And I want you to know that there's a passage in the New Testament in Romans 6, 16. It says, Know ye not, that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You got to be careful who you yield yourself to serve. Mm -hmm. You can become a slave. Just as Israel had become slaves or servants in a foreign land. What I want you to know about that is this, this word, know ye not. The word is Ido. And it's where we get our word I from or sight. And the word has connected to it two thoughts. Number one, to be able to see, but number two, to know. It describes perception. See, many times I can sit here and tell you that sin will destroy your life, but the truth of the matter is, is that if you haven't traveled that journey, if you haven't been in bondage like I've been in bondage, if you haven't seen the freedom that the Lord would liberate you with, it's a little bit difficult for you to see it. But let you take a wrong turn. Let you travel down a pathway. See, sometimes those pathways aren't bad. It's not God's perfect will for our lives, but it allows us to come to a place of clarity. When we go from just hearing about the destruction of sin to where we go to seeing about what it will do in your life and the destruction that it will have. And here Nehemiah sees it with his own eyes. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned. When you have walls broken down on a city, it gives the enemy free reign in the midst of the life. It's representative of the New Testament thought that God has pulled his hand back. That's a scary place to be. 
You don't want to be in a place where God has pulled his hand back and the sinful nature has regained dominion in your life because it's a scary place to be. Amen. 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 Lord, help us. So that was point number one. When you go from hearing to seeing about the, about what sin will do. Point number two, chapter two, verse 10. It says, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, heard of what? Heard that, that now this king that Nehemiah talked to told him, go back and rebuild the walls, part of the city, provide protection so the temple can be rebuilt, so the altar can be reestablished. Amen. And so now a new king in Nehemiah's time is telling them, yes, we need to continue this work. All right. And it says right here that when these guys heard of it, Sanballat and Tobiah heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And it goes on to say, if you, um, it goes on to say later on that they ridiculed them and that they laughed them to scorn. But one of the points that I thought was interesting, I looked up these guys' names. The name Tobiah actually means Jehovah is strength. And so once again, we have a counterfeit. You understand what I'm saying? Just like those guys in the book of Ezra that said, we want to sacrifice to your God. We serve the same God. This guy's name means Jehovah is strength, but he's not really serving the same God that the Israelites are. And they're really in opposition to the plan of God. And I just want to encourage you. Don't think that everything that calls itself Christian or says the word Christ or says the word Jesus or says the word cross is preaching the truth. You better learn for yourself what the word of God says so that you can recognize it. That was point number two. Whenever you start to reestablish the plan or the work of God and you start preaching the truth and you start telling people and trying to trying to allow something to happen where people can receive the truth again and, and, and connect themselves to the sacrifice and connect themselves to the presence of God, you can expect opposition. I'm telling you it's coming. Point number three, and I'm closing. In chapter three, 24 times, look at verse four. Look at verse 4 of chapter 3. It says, next unto them. And then later on in that verse, next unto them. Look at verse 5 in the beginning. Next unto them. Verse 7. Next unto them. Repaired. 24 times it kept saying that. Next unto them. After him. Next unto them. What is it describing? It's describing a line of people on the wall. It's describing all the people of God on the wall, rebuilding the wall. Next unto them. Next unto them. And they're all in unity. And they're all of one purpose. And you know, the Lord put it on my heart to remind you that there's strength in unity when the people of God come together for a common purpose. Amen. I'm here to tell you that we're not talking about building a church once again that's based upon a bunch of programs. I've seen that happen before. Amen. I've heard it preached that way before. Mm -hmm. That we all just get involved. No, we're about, this This church sits distinct. I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend to you that we're the only people that are preaching the gospel. I know better than that. I understand that. But listen to me. This church sits in a, in a little bit of, a, of a, a situation that's different than things that are going on for the most part in the modern church. And what I mean by that is this. There's a spirit that's moving churches to worry about building a social network and making people happy in that sense. And what this church is about is preaching the truth of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. And building disciples that will allow the Lord to live in them and live through them. That's what's different about what we're doing and what we're going to continue to do. And I want to encourage you as I close to remember that. To remember that we hope that people will partner with us as we do that. And that we'll be in unity. And that we'll work next to them. After him. Next to them. As we build something for the Lord. It's not building it for a man. We're building something for the Lord where people can come to hear a gospel. And let me tell you what the Lord put on my heart to tell you. A gospel where you learn how to get a hold of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I, you know good and well I've given most of y'all my phone numbers and I'll call you back when I can. Sometimes I can't. I'll text you back answers to scriptures as much as I can. But listen to me, sometimes a pastor can't do it. What? And you don't need a pastor. You need a Jesus. Amen. Come on somebody, you need a Jesus. Amen. You need to know how to get a hold of him. Yes. And we need some disciples in this church that will learn the gospel and can speak it out of their own mouths to tell people. 
Amen. A friend, amen, and somebody that'll speak the truth to you. Yeah. That'll tell you what you need to hear. Amen.